So I'm going to talk about efficiency. And this is a concept that's very close to my heart. I'm an IBM research engineer. Uh, but I thought I knew what efficiency was all about until I went to Kenya to study the informal economy. That changed my entire view of what efficiency is all about. And I believe that if we can draw lessons from these organically grown informal economies around the world to revise our notion of efficiency, then we can start to design economic systems that are also sustainable and not just efficient. It's a simple concept. The idea is we want to minimize our resources in order to achieve a specified outcome that, uh, that we like. So why is this important? Because it's not just an equation. It's actually a mindset. It's an ideal. And it's the dominant paradigm of the modern era. It drives a lot of our decisions. So why is it so compelling to us? It's compelling because there's this idea that if we can minimize our resources to do work, then as a society, as a whole, we can actually maximize our utility. We're eliminating waste from the system, maximizing our utility, and there's more happiness to go around. It may not be evenly distributed happiness, but there's like a big pie of it, right? So how do we go about starting to reduce those resources that we're using, largely by reducing some of the friction in the system? So we're going to play a game. And this game is called, Are These People Happy? So we are going to go through three elements of Western civilization, our institutions, our economy, and our technology. And we're going to see if these efficient systems, which are encapsulated in nice yellow boxes, are making people happy and how. So in our institutions, we're starting to see a trend towards more vertical integration. It's been going on for a long time. The idea is companies like Walmart want to expand along the supply chain and reduce what's called transaction costs, or any frictions that accumulate when you have trade between different institutions. So we've got Miley Cyrus and friends uh, shopping at Walmart, and I would say that their utility is just off the charts because <laughs> they uh, get to get more for less money, less time, and less effort. Moving on to the economy, uh, in the economy we're seeing another trend, and that's towards actually a new form of capitalism people are calling financial capitalism. We're trading less real assets and more proxies for assets, so things like financial derivatives that aren't like a real asset, but uh, you can trade them more easily, more freely. Again, lower transaction costs, driving more investment. Uh, Shia, how's Shia doing? He's, uh, well, <laughs> no one's really happy on Wall Street, but he seems pretty content with his utility. So finally, if we look at technology, engineers in the West are used to dealing with these tolerances on the scale of millimeters or even micrometers. And the idea is you want to really reduce the amount of friction in your system so it's fabricated exactly the way you designed it. And this engineer is pretty happy about it. He likes the way his, uh, his robot came out. So you know, say what you want about, about culture, but I think Americans are indicating that they want more and more of this type of efficiency, and it's working pretty well for the West. But what if we go here to a place like Nairobi, Kenya? Do the same principles still apply? So in Kenya, the unemployment rate is 40%. Now, that should ring an alarm, an inefficiency alarm. But it's also misleading, because most people don't work in formal, formal employment. They are self-employed, uh, and they're largely unregistered businesses. So in this so-called informal economy of legal but unregistered and unregulated enterprises, uh, that's comprising about 75% of employment in Kenya, and it's similar for the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, what's more, about 90% of new jobs every year are created within this informal economy that doesn't get reported, it doesn't get recorded, and uh, uh, fewer than, less than 10% of jobs are created in the formal economy, the economy that we're used to here in the US. So what we're looking at here is an aerial view of a mixed cluster of uh, industrial, residential, commercial activities. It's one of the most famous and biggest clusters in the world. It's called Kibera. It's in Nairobi. Uh, and these clusters, they emerge organically. Uh, they're totally bottom up. They create their own systems of production and trade that are pretty incredible to witness. And in many ways, they're sort of the last bastion of uh, free market, unregulated capitalism. <coughs> So if we zoom in into our yellow box to see, is, or is there some of this efficiency, some of this utility yielding efficiency that we've been talking about? So let's first look at the institutions. So this is a production hub in Nairobi called Gikumba. And here, uh, we're looking at lots of really tiny institutions. So again, this is the opposite of vertical integration. 
there must be a ton of friction between all these enterprises and it's got to be inefficient. In the economy, this is uh, the labor market, right? So we've got 10 workers here in a shed and one really substantial piece of equipment, and that is an inefficient use of labor. In Kenya, it's said that the typical ratio in a workshop is one person working to nine people cleaning because there's not that much equipment to use. And in technology, this is, uh, these are the resources that people have to work with. So as an engineer, this should ring off a lot of bells saying, OK, how do I get my tolerances down? How do I standardize my design? There's got to be so much flexibility and variation in your production processes that it is not efficient. So the typical response to this is to start to just sort of drop in institutions that we know from a Western perspective are efficient. So things like factories and banks, and we'll just pop them all around because that's what we do. And <laughs> what happens? <laughs> well, not that much actually happens because in a factory you're going to employ uh, maybe a dozen or two people, and the equipment isn't going to get maintained because it's really difficult to get replacement parts, and you don't have the skills to fix all this equipment that was imported. Uh, and the same thing is in a bank, where people aren't actually getting the financial services that they need. And from a national perspective, this is not efficient. So we need to revise what we think of as efficient in this context. And that means changing how we think about technology and employment, how we think about services and collateral. And we're seeing that in scores in, uh, in the microfinance movement, for example. So when we come up with this new conception of efficiency and then re-examine the systems, the indigenous systems that are already in place, they start to look more efficient than we realize, and perhaps more so than these institutions that we're dropping in. So here are three rules that I propose uh, to start to change our conception a little bit. One for institutions, economy, and technology. First, we want to change the scope of the system and then uh, reduce transaction costs in different ways, start looking at alternatives to vertical integration, and finally, redefine how, what we think of as the outcome of the system. So first, change the scope of the system, because when we say something's efficient, it depends on how we draw our boundaries around it. And we can take some cues here from biology. Instead of comparing businesses to each other to see if they're efficient, we can compare entire ecosystems. Uh, because in biology, an efficient ecosystem is said to have no waste, but an organism it still does. So here is our lolophant, and our uh, lolophant is stomping around the savanna. He's leaving his waste around, much like a business, right? But in most cases, unless your business is really stomping around the savanna and all that, uh, waste is okay. Uh, because if we expand to the ecosystem, that the ecosystem doesn't have any more waste because the organisms are engaging in symbiotic relationships. So Lion King gets the yellow box, stamp of efficiency. Uh, we need to start thinking in ecosystems. So let's go back to our institutions in Gikomba. And it turns out that this is a pretty efficient ecosystem because each of these nodes, each of these businesses, is engaging in symbiotic relationships with the other ones. So one business's waste is an input or, or a product for another business. And, it, and people are reusing materials, there are scrap pickers and there are traders filling in all these little gaps, and the entire ecosystem is pretty closed, it is leaving virtually no waste behind as a whole. So next, start to look at alternatives to vertical integration in order to reduce our transaction costs. So in order to reduce friction in the system, we can uh, rely less on things like contracts or vertical integration and more on social relations of trust. In the informal economy, trust is really important because you don't have that legal protection. So you have to rely on trust to get credit or to uh, create rotating savings funds among your peers or pool resources. And all of these things actually make the system more efficient. So if we go back to our 10 workers and one piece of equipment, this is a little more efficient now because they're sharing workers, they're sharing equipment, uh, they're sharing money, and they're using it uh, what they need when they need it. So this is a relationship-based economy rather than a law-based economy. And finally, redefine the outcome of the system. We said we want to reduce the amount of resources we're using in order to uh, achieve a certain outcome that, we, that we, uh, is pre-specified. But we can flip this around and say, let's take our resources as given and do as much as we can with that to maximize our outcome. And this is called resourcefulness. And this is something that's practiced just about every day in the informal economy. 
and they're making amazing things like this machine for cutting grass all out of scrap metal. And there's a famous story of William Cam Kwamba, who is now my age, but at age 14, he uh, dropped out of school in rural Malawi. He built his own windmill, all out of, of, all out of scrap parts. And he uh, built a windmill that powered lights in his home in a village that didn't have electricity or running water. And all of these stories are using these resources, right? So these resources that we said were inefficient before are actually producing pretty cool inventions. And how is that happening? It's because economics can't seem to account for this, uh, this other variable called creativity. And when you constrain your resources and try to get as much uh, useful product out of what you're given, then you're more likely to be creative. So going back to the rules, if we, if we revise our notion of efficiency to, to match this new conception, then the indigenous systems on the ground are already efficient, like we said. Uh, so we need to, as people interested in uh, perhaps business in the developing world, or development, or design for social impact, start adapting to the systems that are already in place in order to get at that development. But what about here? Do these rules also apply here, or is this just a developing world thing? Well, we know that our vision for an efficient world didn't really turn out the way we wanted. We're depleting our resources at alarming rates. There's vast social inequality. So let's try it out. Uh, if we change the scope of the system, that means we can start looking at entire supply chains. See, are, is there a market opportunity to fill some of those gaps? Is there a market opportunity for reuse or repair the way there is uh, very much so in the informal economy. Uh, in the economy, uh, reducing transaction costs in new ways. So can we start pooling our resources, sharing, uh, renting? And uh, this is a practice that is alive and well here in Brooklyn, where people are working in cooperatives. They are sharing equipment. They're uh, sharing uh, space, for example. And they're working in much more open and collaborative ways among enterprises. So it's, again, relationship-based. And finally, in technology, if we redefine the goal to say we're going to work with the resources that are given to us, that can produce more meaningful and interesting and creative innovations. And that's something we're seeing here in the do-it-yourself and craft movements. So we're starting to get a picture here of an economy that's not only efficient, but also sustainable. So as we move forward, as we move into the future, we're going to have to start doing a lot more with a lot less if we want to survive. Right? So we must look towards the informal economy for these insights and how to be both efficient and sustainable. And we need to collaborate towards a more sustainable global future, West End uh, informal economy. So thank you.